Father, we thank you that you have spoken, that you have invited us into your story, that through your Holy Spirit, even now you are speaking. And so we ask today that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears to receive the wonder of what you have for us. Without your help, it can't happen. So we ask you to come and help. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I get What you just watched is a clip from the 16-minute short film called 10 Meter Tower. Has anybody seen this before? Oh my goodness, it's so good. The film is simply 16 minutes of normal everyday people stepping up to the 10 meter platform like they use in those really high Olympic dives and trying to jump. 10 meters may not sound like much, but that's 30 feet above the water, three stories up, looking down over the edge, utterly, completely terrifying. The film is, is this fascinating case study in how we handle fear, especially because this particular fear is self-inflicted, right? Normal life is scary enough. All the things that we have to go out into the world and face every day are perfectly sufficient to set us on edge. We just did a whole sermon series on Psalm 37 focused on the anxieties, frets, worries of everyday life. There's plenty out there to deal with, we don't need extra. But this 10 meter tower is totally, completely extra. The participants were given 30 bucks to just walk up to the top and be filmed. There's no prize for jumping. There's no cash taken away if they don't jump. But by taking that 30 bucks, they're invited into something much deeper, much crazier, much wilder than what they would face in normal life. And as you can tell, it absolutely wrecks them for 16 minutes straight in the video. Watching this video actually brought to mind our gospel passage, which we're gonna be preaching on for the next three weeks. That first meeting between Jesus and the disciples after the resurrection in John chapter 20, verse 21. They're afraid, the text says, afraid of the religious leaders, afraid of going the same way that Jesus had just gone, and they're afraid with that like extra layered on kind of fear. Because the, before they met Jesus, they had all the normal problems of life, right? Providing for their family, uh, illness, tragedy, uh, political oppression. But after they met Jesus, oh man, they had all those problems and so many more problems. Being with Jesus was just like problems on top of problems. Problems with their families of origin as they left them. Problems with provision. Problems with feeding gigantic crowds, not just your own family. Problems of religious persecution. Problems of, of everyone deserting your rabbi who you've put your entire trust in a couple different times. And then problems of fleeing for your life while your rabbi is being murdered by the state. Problems of wondering whether you're next. More Jesus, more problems. There's a bumper sticker for you. <laughs> but then the same Jesus who was crucified, who had led them into all this nuttiness, shows up 
and invites them into something even deeper, even wilder, even crazier than what they had yet known. He invites them up to the spiritual equivalent of the 10 meter tower. John 20, verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We need to re recapture the wonder of this. Jesus is inviting his very ordinary disciples into the same extraordinary work that he was sent to do. Nothing less than making everything right again. He is inviting them to take a place, their place in the work of healing the world, the work of forgiving sins, healing bodies, resisting oppression, loving enemies, seeing the unseen, feasting with the broken, bearing witness, challenging people to make a decision, calling out hypocrisy. He's inviting them into everything that we think of as evangelism and everything we think of as mercy and justice. He's inviting them to foster restored, relations with the, restored relationship with the Father and restored relationships with one another. He's inviting them to lay down their lives and be filled with the power of the Spirit who raised him from the dead. He's doing nothing less than inviting them into the mission of Father, Son, and Spirit that is making all things new. I mean, you couldn't get any bigger. It, it boggles the mind what he's inviting them into and therefore inviting us into. Because it's not just these 10 who happen to be in the room who live into this. The whole church through the centuries has found themselves on that tower. Right? In every age, every nation, every local church, the resurrected Jesus continues to walk into rooms filled with fearful people and say, Nobody stays, everybody sends. Now, I know that many of us struggle with purpose and meaning and why we're here and how we spend our days and weeks and months and years and decades because they're all just flying by and we wonder where they went and they wonder if it meant anything. But friends, we know why we're here. I know your purpose, and that's not because I'm special. It's an open secret. It's not a mystery. You are here to join Jesus in his work of healing the world gone wrong. Your purpose in life is to be a part of the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. If you feel kind of stuck in that because you don't know exactly where your niche is, don't worry about it. Just start trying things. If you doubt it because you think you're not gifted in the right ways or you think you've messed up too badly or you're trapped in how others have hurt you, just, just step back and look at the lives of these disciples. They're cowards and, and self-righteous blowhards and, and pretty bad sinners. The reality is what he's inviting them into is what he's inviting us into. So if he could invite them, he could also invite us. We've all wasted time and messed up and missed out on the reason we were made. But we are being remade every hour, every day, being ongoingly renewed in the image of God by the Spirit. So it is not over yet. We can fritter away our lives flailing around in what could have been or what might be, or we can get down to the business of doing the work of the kingdom that's right in front of us right now. Now sometimes that's gonna mean doing ordinary things in ways different than the world or your sinful nature telling you to do them. Most of what Jesus did was oddly normal. He walked and talked and ate and saw, and blessed, and challenged, and provided for his mama. Right? So many of our days are, are filled with raising kids, 
to love God, to, to care for our parents, to, to bless neighbors who, who hide, to give away money when we're not sure we have it to give, to, to live with integrity at work, to spend time in prayer when our to-do list is long. That's all the quiet, everyday work of the kingdom. And it is work. It brings problems on top of all the other problems you might have. It's more difficult than just making it. But on top of those extraordinarily ordinary things, sometimes being sent as Jesus was sent means doing new things, unusual things, weird things, crazy things. Right? Nobody naturally has spend time mentoring vulnerable kids like in your calendar built in. It's got to go there and take the place of something else. Nobody shares the gospel with a friend and invites them to make a decision to trust in Christ because you know what? That was just easier than not saying anything. Nobody prays a prayer for physical healing or shares a prophetic word that the Spirit has impressed upon them without wondering whether they are going to look like a raving idiot for doing so. All of it's risky. All of it feels just a little bit like stepping out onto that 10-meter tower. Honestly, being in leadership here at IEC feels a little bit right now like stepping out on that 10-meter tower. At minimum, minimum, 45 IACers and $70,000 in tithes and offerings a year are walking out the door in two weeks when Restoration Anglican is sent. That's so exciting. We want more. It's so beautiful to see what God has been doing, and it's also terrifying. We're making our budget for next year, and that sounds like a lot of money. But on the other hand, it doesn't sound like enough. Sending out 50 folks doesn't change the reality that we continue to grow really fast. Just to give you a glimpse of this, one out of every three people in this room was not here 20 months ago. Maybe that's you. Just as soon as we send the church plan out, we're going to be having an all-church conversation on September 8th here at IAC to explore things like adding a service, buying a facility, expanding our staffing. It's super exciting. Like looking over the edge of that 10-meter diving platform is exciting. My spirit has done that move he did like, so many times. The joke uh, around our team is if like you're looking for stability in church right now, like best to go with the church plant. (laughs) We've said it all along, but now it feels really true. Everybody's sent, nobody stays. We're all being called forward in the work God has given us to do. There's not the A team and the bench warmers, the planters and the stayers. This is all of us being called into the work that God is doing together. And I would guess that you were already stressed out about life before I said any of that. That's all extra. You don't have to walk into any of that. You can just sit at home and eat artisanal cheeses and watch Netflix and deal with a normal amount of crazy, hard, difficult things. You you can absolutely go back into a life that feels just a bit safer because that is the gravity of the human heart. Right? That's what we do. We lean towards, drift back towards, tend towards safety and security. We can only do so much crazy. We can only deal with so much difficulty. We need to have a confidence underneath that it's going to be okay. And that is hard enough with the normal stuff. Much less when we add on all this kingdom building. Much less when we're putting ourselves out there in the work of healing the world. Now, it's tempting to get to this point in the sermon and to say more or less, you know what? Don't be afraid. Put yourself out there and see what happens. It's going to be okay. Except that it doesn't always turn out okay. We try it, and we crash. We put ourselves out there, and we get burned. We engage with someone and we get hurt. So many stories of that in this room, right? The number one reason people leave the church is the people at the church. 
the number one reason people leave the mission field is fellow missionaries. Right? The problems that we face that are added on are real. The struggles are real. The fear is founded. It is legitimate. If we follow Jesus into his mission, there will be these crucifixions awaiting us along the way. But there's a secret to being sent with Jesus to be a part of the healing of the world. If we just try to imitate him outright, just try to do what he did, we will fail again and again and again. If we simply try to copy him, we will not make it for the long haul. The secret to following Jesus into his mission to heal the world is not just knowing what we're supposed to do. That's part of it. But underneath that, we have to know what he is doing. And what he is doing is surrounding us, enfolding us, carrying us, protecting us with an abundance that ensures that we are more safe and secure than we know. Verse 21 again. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Notice that word again. It's there because he already said a part of this. Just two verses earlier, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. He says it twice. Now this was, of course, the stock greeting of the Jews, actually still is, much like what's up for a certain generation of Americans or salam alaikum in the Muslim world. It's a, it's a blessing that it becomes sort of a stylized form of hello. But on Jesus' lips, at this moment, entering this locked room with these people, in that fear, it became so much more. We can tell the disciples didn't get it at first because he had to say it twice. Peace be with you. Freak out ensues. Like, oh, hold on. Peace be with you. We cannot join Jesus in his mission, in his sentness to heal the world for the long haul unless we hear these words addressed to us and for us. Peace be with you. The word peace is a translation of the Hebrew word shalom. It's such a rich word. It's not just the absence of hostility or, or, or an emotion. It's, it's a wholeness. It's a completeness. It's the abundance of flourishing. It's the world the way it's meant to be, full of joy and contentment and satisfaction. That's what shalom is. It's where everything is trending because of what Christ has done. And in this blessing, that shalom is spoken towards us, placed on us, given around us by the one who carries that shalom in himself self through the resurrection. It takes the whole rest of the New Testament to play out what this peace be to you means for us, right? According to Ephesians, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. We are chosen, forgiven, adopted, anointed. We have died with Christ. We are raised with Christ. We are seated in the heavenly realms and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. We are his beloved children. There is so much still undone, but there's the promise that one day everything left undone will be done and the Holy Spirit we have now is the deposit, the, the source of hope that God is moving things in that direction and giving us eyes to see the ways in which he is doing it. That peace is given as gift. And it is with us. Peace be with you. The emotion that comes along with this is part of it, but it's not just the emotion. That waxes and wanes. It's not always with us. This shalom is a state of being. 
an identity, an office we've been welcomed into, a, a status, a license that we carry with us. This shalom is surrounding us, embracing us, carrying us, walking with us. We may not feel it, but it shapes our feelings over the long haul. We may not see it, but we see the fruits of it over months and years and decades. This, this abundance does not desert us when we turn away from God and return to us when we get our act together. It is a sticky gift. It clings to us even when we do not have the strength to cling to it. Peace be with you. Y'all, actually, it's the plural. You, broken, battered, confused, doubting, all over the place people, this peace is with you people struggling to figure this out together, people who are afraid of one another, who are hurting one another, who are tripping over one another, who are trying to encourage one another and end up just saying dumb things that don't help. This piece is with you. It's not just your private experience, it's a shared inheritance. It's the well from which we all drink, the table around which we all gather, the unity that binds us. This is our inheritance. And this is where the invitation to be sent starts. The invitation to go starts with the confidence that he stays. Being sent begins with the assurance that we are surrounded by him and his abundance and we couldn't escape it if we tried. We know this is true, not just because Jesus says it, but because Jesus lives it. Right? All throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus was completely, totally confident that our Father was for him. Right? At the baptism of Jesus, the Father says, this is my Son whom I love, in him I am well pleased. That kicks everything off. And all throughout the Gospel of John, we see these glimpses of what's keeping Jesus going. John 8, 54, the Father glorifies me. John 10, 15, the Father knows me. John eleven forty one, 41, Father, you always hear me. John 15, 9, the Father loves me. John 17, 2, the Father has granted me authority. John 17, 10, all you have is mine. John 17, 24, you have given me glory because you loved me before the creation of the world. Friends, there's nothing I just quoted about Jesus that is not also true of you when you are in Jesus. All of that is true of you. His whole life and ministry was built on this rock-solid confidence that his father was for him and with him, leading him into shalom, coming from shalom. So that even at the moment where that seemed least likely, seemed least realistic, seemed least believable, where everything in his experience would be screaming, he's not here. He was able to say, into your hands I commit my spirit. Church, here's the logic of the gospel. As the Father was with Christ, so Christ is with us. As the Father knew Christ, loved Christ, shared with Christ, glorified Christ, gave authority to Christ, heard Christ when he prayed, so Christ does with us. His relationship with us is the mirrored reflection of the Father's relationship with him. That's the shalom that we rest in. And it's from that shalom, from that confidence, that we can plant churches and speak the gospel, and serve the poor, and parent our kids, and give generously. To the extent that we receive the reality of that peace, we can receive the reality that there is enough and more than enough in him. Now, it's one thing to say that, but that is so slippery It's ridiculously hard to remember. We need reminders, which is why we do what we do every Sunday. 
during that moment of the service, we call the passing of the peace. Doesn't mean the service is over if you're new, like it's not over yet. It's not just the time we greet one another. It's not punishment time for introverts. (laughs) We're looking one another in the eyes and saying, peace to you. Peace, peace to you. We're blessing one another, speaking the same words that Jesus spoke, passing them on from the Christ who lives in me to you and receiving them from the Christ who lives in you to me. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cacophony of drenching one another in reminders that abundance has come and has not stopped coming, that shalom is breaking in and carrying us forward, that this peace is not just for us, it is also for you. Because it's that continually coming peace, that relentless blessing being spoken over us by Jesus through our words over and over again that carries us through the fear. It doesn't abolish the fear. Heck no. At least not most of the time. Peace and fear don't cancel each other out like some weird spiritual math problem. Being surrounded in shalom enables us to move forward in the midst of those natural fears. It allows us to plant in the midst of fear. It allows us to discipline our kids in the midst of fear, and there's a lot of fear tied up in that. It allows us to to, to call out a friend who's destroying their life in the midst of fear, to to maybe add a service in the midst of fear, to to volunteer in the midst of fear, to stand up to a corrupt coworker in the midst of fear, to say no to work so we can get a date night in the midst of fear of what that might mean, so we can speak the gospel to a friend in the midst of fear of being rejected. Because the reality, the thing that is most really real and most truly true is that we have nothing to lose. Nothing ultimate, nothing permanent, nothing that can't be resurrected. That's what the risen Jesus' presence in this room means. It means that even if the worst happened, and what's the worst that can happen? Death is the worst can happen. Not even death can destroy that safety. We are secure in him. And that security means we're free. Free to get up out of that room with the locked doors free to go do something crazy together. May we have the confidence in his affection to follow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son And we thank you for the audacious privilege of being invited to join him in his work. Father, in the places that we count ourselves out from that, would you draw us forward? Would you fill us with your spirit by faith? And in the places where we know we're being drawn forward, but we are afraid, would you speak your words over us? Jesus, would you speak again? into each one of our lives and hearts, into this local church. Peace. Peace. Peace be with you. Amen.